There was no digital telecommunications industry. It did not exist. There were no digital cell phones. There was no World Wide Web. We're going to create what comes after the personal computer. It was a telephone. It was essentially going to be a smartphone with a lot of intelligence. When we were talking about reinventing telephony, we meant it. We're trying to make something that people love. We need it to be like your watch, your glasses, your wallet. We decided to make everything. That meant we were custom building every piece. It's, it's insane. And how small will it finally be, do you think? Someday, get Tracy Wishwatch. This was the beginning of what became, I think, the most important company to come out of Silicon Valley that nobody's ever heard of. It was this aura of secrecy. You know, it had Apple's fairy dust sprinkled on it. We had no idea what it was, but by the rumors, it seemed just captivating. We had no choice but to keep quiet about the things we were doing because other companies were interested in it as well. Now, it should be noted, John Scully was running Apple at the time. He was our ally, or so we thought. Today, we are launching Newton a revolution for the pocket. They had uh, decided to make something essentially based on our original models. It's the most important thing that I've ever been involved with in my entire life. It's bad enough you get betrayed by them, but now they're going to try to put you out of business. That was fighting. That was bad. I mean, here's a test. What if general magic never happened? Would we have had Android? Not a chance. I mean, all these things were linked together, one after another. So much of what came out of General Magic is the foundation of everything we take for granted today. And so the question is, can we take these powerful tools and do something that really does help a lot of people? The reason you should care about the story of General Magic is because it involves something fundamental, and that is failure isn't the end. Failure is actually the beginning. Looking back at my mails, 2007 was the first time I wrote to uh, Tony to say, come to India. So um, it just took a few years, but here he is on his first trip to India. Very and, first time. Uh, yes. Very first time in India. <laughs> it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for being so, so nice and so welcoming. Thank you. So hopefully first of many, as we always yes, say. Yes, there are going to be many more. <laughs> so you've been at the center of very innovative products. Actually, the first time I met you, you just did iPod. And he told me that when I asked him to come to India, he said, oh, I'm in the midst of a very important product, which is in stealth mode, which now we know he was co-inventing iPhone at that time. And that's why he couldn't come. So tell me a little bit about some, we're talking about moments, right? So tell me a couple of unforgettable moments for you in these product developments and working with people who are very iconic, be it a general magic or Apple. Just tell me a couple of moments. Well, the, the moments really are the realizations that, for me, is when you hit that consumer insight or that real hard problem or what have you, and we come together as a group and we, we argue in a creative, tension way and are able to see past it and find the solution. So each time we, we embrace failure and, or uh, maybe coming failure, and we just say, okay, what are we gonna do to get around this? We have a mission, we have a vision, we need to break through it. And then we gather together as a, as a group and we put the best ideas on the table and uh, you know, it, it rises up sooner or later. And also it's, you know, sometimes they come as success, but other times they come as failure. Yeah. So it's a lot of times understanding not just how you got to a point, but also after whatever you were trying to materialize comes to reality, what actually happens with that? And a lot of times, and many of the places that you know, you'll see up here in, in the different products I've made, were failure after failure after failure. You saw General Magic, yeah. right? General Magic, most of you probably have no idea what that company was, but literally we were making the iPhone just 15 years too early. Yeah. And Android came out of that, and the iPhone came out of that team, and a whole host of other things. But nobody's ever heard of it. Yeah. But that company was an utter failure. Over a billion dollars invested. 
pre-internet to die. And then I went off from there and I, I was dejected, I was the lowest person on the totem pole, and then yet again, another failure, and yet another, another failure until success happened about yeah. 10 years into my journey into Silicon Valley. Yeah, we saw on the video where they pointed to you, you had long blonde hair. If you noticed that, you know, that was my old self before I pressed the reset button. And so at the... T as Tony 2.0 Tony 2.0. That was 1.0. <laughs> so as we entered the new millennium, you joined Apple in 2001. Yes. And uh, you, and so tell us a little bit about how did iPod come into being? Because we take all these things for granted sitting today, but when you go back to that time, right, the music right. industry was ruled by music labels and computers were for computing. There wasn't a connection between the two. So how did the iPod come into being? Well, first you have to remember there was, a, there was technology, of course, yeah. but then there was also the Apple element. So before Apple decided to do an iPod, there was already MP3s out there, and the, right. the music market was already starting to crater because people were transferring music around for free because there was this internet, and it was fast enough you could move m music around. And so that was already happening, and then at the same time you had Apple, yeah. which was a very different Apple than now. Yeah. So Apple then was literally, it had maybe $250 million in the bank, <laughs> And it had $500 million of debt and less than a percent or around a percent of market share in the U.S. for its computers. That's what it was like in 2001. Very different Amazing. story today, right? Amazing, yeah. And so it was, the, it was Apple who was basically, yeah. you know, for all intents and purposes, near death, okay? It was the change in yeah. the music situation. And those things came together and, yeah. and uh, with you know, my interest in music and the things that I had done, all of those things collided with iTunes and the iPod was born. Yeah. You know, literally in, from, in six weeks from the time I got the call to the time we did the pitch to Steve was six weeks. And then after that was about seven, eight months and the iPod shipped. Wow. Crazy, so crazy you, the whole from idea to production was about seven to eight months. I got the call just, I got the call the third week of January. I went in and signed on as a contractor in the middle of March, uh, February. In 2001, pitched to Steve. We're talking about 2001. 2001. Yeah. Pitched to Steve in, in the end of March. And then it shipped the, uh, and was launched in the last week of October. And that was the entire team had to get built, the product had to get built, the manufacturing line had to get, everything had to happen in, in clockwork order to, to make that happen. So tell me a little bit, did anybody sleep? How many people worked on it? I mean, oh, how, man. what it, does it, I can't imagine today shipping anything in such a short amount of time. It was a new technology. It wasn't like it was all Yeah, no, out, no, there, right? there, Apple didn't have the screen technology, the battery technology or anything, and didn't even have the team. So yeah. I'd pull all of that together. So um, we actually did our first hires in May. So the first hires to the team were in May. So, you know, there are not a lot of people from inside Apple, but a lot of people from outside Apple. And so that was May. So, you know, in between shipping and there, we also had 9-11, unfortunately, which yeah. actually was a huge problem September, for, yeah. for a lot of yeah. logistics reasons and all kinds of other emotional reasons. Yeah. But literally, in that short a period of time, we were able yeah. to put together a team of about 30 and, a, and, and a, a manufacturing in Taiwan and make it all happen. Wow. So now that was followed by the iPhone you know, co-inventing the iPhone. So tell us a little bit about how did that come about? Because again, we take Apple phone for granted today, but it wasn't a phone company at that time. No, no, no. So yeah. how did that come about? So one, it was, you know, the iPod was a total like, okay, we're gonna try this thing, right? And there was a, there's a lot of stories because it wasn't even clear to me that we were gonna actually ship it. And I almost didn't even join the company. And so, when we, it came time for the iPhone, it wasn't really about making an iPhone. What it was about was the iPod in 2004 started to see that, oh, the, the different, you know, m people were starting to really get mobile phones in their hands. Real dumb mobile phones as we know them today, but mobile phones. And then the mobile phone companies got, uh, uh, carriers as well as the handset guys, got real jealous of the iPod. 
They got really jealous and they said, wait a second, that's just a processor and speaker. We got all that stuff. We can just put it on our phone. Yeah. And so here's Apple finally starting to see traction. iPods are 50% of sales. And we're like, uh-oh, these guys are going to come in and take away because people only want to want to carry one thing in their pocket. Yes. Right? They only want to put one thing in their pocket, not an iPod and a phone. So which one's going to win? Right? And we didn't want to be the losing side of that. So we said was, first, we're going to put iTunes on mobile phones. Yeah. So we're going to work with Motorola and Nokia and all those guys. And we're going to put iTunes music on there so that they can get a few songs, but then we're going to really want an iPod. Yeah. Well, that didn't go well uh, at all. And there was a yeah. product launch and it died you know, literally as fast as it was launched. Um, and then that's where it really hit all of us that yes, we are, goose was cooked, we're, mobile phones are gonna take over, we're gonna have to eat our own, and we're gonna have to figure out a way to basically leapfrog ourselves and before the cell phone industry gets there. Yeah. And so we were grappling with multiple things. We had four different projects going on at the time, and all of those came together that ultimately was the iPhone. And that took two and a half years to actually right. get right. Yeah. We, had, we, had two, we had two huge full prototypes running, and we threw both of those away before we actually made the third one that we shipped, yeah. which was the first generation iPod that everyone knows. Yeah. So the thing is, you've done all these things. You talk about how you, at that generation, you all grew up with Apple and Steve and Steve and all this stuff, and here you end up in that company, and you're there for, you know, 10 years. And then you decide to leave to start Nest. What was that decision like? What made that happen? And uh, to, to, to leave Apple? Yeah. Well, actually, the, the leaving Apple had nothing to do with Nest, actually. Okay. The leaving Apple had everything to do with the fact that one day I came home. My wife also worked for Steve for 10 years. And we, we met at Apple and everything. And so our whole life of the time we knew each other was around Apple. And so what had happened was we were married and we're building the company and all these different things. And we had two children yeah. at that point. And they were one and two, or one, a half a year and a year and a half, something like that. And we came home and one of our sons was really, really upset. Mm. Like, just couldn't stop crying and everything. And so my wife goes to console, Case is his name, co console him. And literally he ran away from her and ran to the nanny. He ran off to the nanny. And that, and my wife just, of course, bawling and all this stuff. And I was just like, something's wrong here. Yeah. We're not spending time with our kids. We're not spending time. We're having a great time at Apple. But these children are really the future and we should be spending time with them. And so... My wife and I looked at each other, <laughs> and we just said, time to hang up our spurs at Apple. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and so that's what we did. So we retired from Apple in, 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 in 20, 2009, 2010, and we traveled around the world for a year and a half okay. with the kids. Okay. And then how did Nest come about? No. How did you go into a how did Nest IoT go? area and Nest? So the iPod was a passion of mine because I was a music lover and DJ and all that stuff and doing all kinds of things. Um, and when it came to Nest, I wanted to design a home for our family in Lake Tahoe that was the greenest, most connected home. And at the time, you, you would have to buy all of these different products, you know, that were not anything like what you know today, but back then it was all these really old 20-year-old like thermostats and, and alarm systems and everything, and they looked really ugly. They were yeah. hard to use. Everyone had to buy them, but no one liked them at all. And so through the process of designing this home, I was trying to find all kinds of interesting new products. I couldn't find them. Yeah. And then we went around the world for a year and a half, and we were living in France and Spain and yeah. Hawaii and all over, and we couldn't find anything uh, in, in those houses that worked either. Yeah. And I was like, wait a second. You mean these products that take our, all over our houses, yeah. that we pay money for, we hate, and everybody in the world has these problems, and they're consuming energy. These things can be reinvented. And that's yeah. literally what Nest was all about. 
So okay. it started first with the smoke de or with the with the thermostat to save energy, and then after that, it was a whole lineup of things, and and yeah. so it was all that getting out of Silicon Valley, having a different mindset, traveling the world, and seeing the problem in a yeah. new way was the inspiration for for creating that company. So were there any translations from your lessons learned from <clears throat> iPod or iPhone, et cetera, that have come into building Nest or creating the product? What were some of those learnings that came in for you? Well, you know, at each place, at General Magic, I really got to wor work with a world-class product team. And then I learned about marketing and sales uh, when I did some of these other products, especially at Apple, right, and innovation. And so when you, when you look at the world, I, I say, how can we disrupt the world? How can we disrupt the incumbents that are already there? Don't just make something better. Make something 10 times better that the other competitors can't figure out how to do. And in every chance, if you can do that, you could have a chance of winning and winning big. You can obviously have a little win, but we want big wins. We want big wins to change the world. And it was all through disruptive technology that made that happen. So in the case of the iPod, it was a lot of different disruptive stuff. Same thing with iPhone. So whenever we look at new products, new investments, new companies, we're always looking for that disruptive factor because these products, remember, we killed Sony. We killed Nokia. We killed Motorola. We killed all these incumbents who just laughed at us, who said they're never going to do anything. But because we had a better idea, a better team, and much, much better technology that they didn't understand, that's the way we won. Yeah. With, with obviously great marketing and great execution and all the other things that are, yeah. uh, you know, fundamental. Yeah, and I think I seem to always meet you in transition points. When I first met you, I thought you were going to iPhone. The second time we met, you were at Nest, and then later on, you left Nest. I mean, you sold it to Google, and then... Uh, and you're you know, getting to the next stage of you've started uh, Future Shape LLC now. So tell us about that transition now. You've, you've been an entrepreneur, started things. You've been with a large company that failed, General Magic. Large company where products succeeded at Apple. Then your own entrepreneurial journey that had a successful exit. And now you are at this juncture where you can transfer some of this knowledge to others. So tell exactly. me about that. Exactly. So we have a, a, a company actually started about eight, ten years ago in stealth. It was called Future Shape. And what we're doing is we're investing in companies all around the world to help them who have deep technology to, to basically disrupt the, the systems that are there for the better. We go in and we work with these, these startups, these entrepreneurs to help them and not just give them money, but we call ourselves mentors with money. We go in and we mentor them and help them where they need it, whether it's sales or marketing, a product or operations or just, you know, how to lead, these kinds of things, communicate. And so we go in and we help them because during the time when I was traveling around the world, I was retired for a year and a half. Yeah. And I learned, wow, retirement is no fun. <laughs> it's absolutely no fun. Um, and so my brain was going crazy and, and so, there was a way of like, how can you take all the knowledge and all the connections and everything and reuse them and stay in the game, but without all the blood, sweat, and tears of an entrepreneur? Because at this point, you know, it's been 30 some odd years, because I actually had four startups before General Magic. Right. So it's been a long time in my career. It's like, I, and I have this, I have our family and everything. I have to have a different priority set. So now we have over 200 uh, companies that we invest in around the world, doing fundamental deep technology, and we get to basically be mentors with money. I, the way I say it is, we give you money so you give us a job, so I don't stay retired, Yeah. right? <laughs> and, and, that's, and, and, and that allows us to be incredibly curious. We learn with them, we help them, but I think they give us 10x more because of what we can see through their eyes and, the, and their fresh eyes to be able to, you know, uh, live a very curious and, and hopefully fulfilled life and, and bring some of these incredible innovations to market. You know, if you look here, there's some of them like um, yeah. Modern Meadow. That's leather without a cow. We're making huge, huge sheets of real leather, biofabricated from, from collagen skin cells, and we're making those. 
right? We're, we're doing, we're doing that's, that's literally, thank you. That's literally one fiftieth of the carbon, cons you know, emitted in with that kind of a, 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 a technology. We're doing other things like phenonic, where we're blowing up the compressor, anything that's free, fr uh, freezing or heating, all your refrigerators, we turned to totally solid state. We're selling uh, medical refrigerators and, and soon consumer refrigerators, and we're getting rid of compressors and 40% less energy use. Yeah. So these are the kind of things, impossible foods, meat without a cow. All these different yes, things, yeah. right, are about thinking and imagining what the world's gonna look like in 20, 30 years from now, and investing in it now, and we understand it's gonna take 10 years to come to fruition and change societies. But work with those entrepreneurs with amazing missions and help them change the world yeah. for the better. My son had the impossible burger. Oh, he did? When we were in Palo Alto and he said, oh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Wait till version 2.0. It's coming soon. Seriously, I'm so, not kidding. So, you know, Tony, in all your travels across Asia, Europe, US, all these things, what is an advice you have for entrepreneurs, especially in India? This is your first trip to India and you met a few of them right sure, now, sure. but what would you like to give as an advice or a suggestion or a learning for entrepreneurs? Especially in developed educationally, developed educational systems. You are trained to, there's always the right answer. Like you're gonna take a test, somewhere you're gonna find the answer. And therefore, when I pass the test, I've passed and I've done the right thing. And I've learned, right? That's what you, we've been taught for, you know, decades and decades, centuries, right? The real world is not that. The real world, there is no test. If you're changing it, there is no school that's going to teach you how to change the world or what you're going to need to do to change the world. And usually, when you try to change the world or you try to do something different, you are going to inevitably fail. And failure is the way we learn. And if you have productive failure and you learn from that, you can go on to do the next thing and the next thing and you can keep taking more bold risks. But understand, failure is the way you learn. In school, you're taught failure, you're not gonna pass, you're not going anywhere. You're not learning. In life, you need to fail just like when you learn to walk. You didn't just get up and walk one day. Yeah. You failed at walking for many, many weeks and months. Fell many times. <laughs> right? Till you got up and you learned and you did it. Yeah. That's exactly what life is. And you got to remember that because just like I said, if I would have given up from the time of General Magic in 1991, we would have never done, I would have never done the iPod or the iPhone or whatever came after it. Yeah. It was literally around 15 years of failure. Yeah in Silicon Valley with the best minds and the best teams and the best money and everything. So you're going to fail, just embrace it and move on and learn from it because that's the people who can endure those paths are the ones who are gonna ultimately be successful because they're gonna break through and figure it out. Can you, my last question to you is, can you think of, what do you think is the next big disruption in technology? What do you think is gonna drive the future? Well, it's not one thing. Sure. It's sure. not one thing. What it is, is all the IT technology, everything that we've been creating the last 50, 50 odd years, we have now democratized it to the point where we can make it collide with every single industry. Yeah. And so whether that's agriculture tech plus technology, food plus technology, bio plus technology, medical, auto plus more technology, yeah. everywhere you look, we're going to take this incredible IT revolution and we're going to, and mobile revolution, and just collide it with every single incumbent who hasn't really addressed the technology. They may have addressed the communications. Oh, we have now email in our organization, but they still do traditional ways. Correct. Right? And we're talking about generative design, AI helping and co-evolving humans to help us to find better solutions for drug discovery. We're, we're doing cancer vaccines now. We're using AI to help us find ways to make a vaccine for cancer. We funded one of those companies, right? So it's now using this technology to help us and help us co-evolve to find new solutions to old and existing problems that we've never seen before in every single industry. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm just, and on every single continent, right? Yes. Silicon Valley is no longer 
the, the, the hub it used to be of everything. We have now democratized source code through open source, through Android. We've made computers in the hands of you know, over 50% 50, 50 and now gonna be 100% of, you know, of the global population in the next 15 years. Technology has been democratized. Everyone, everywhere can actually be a part of the revolution and help hopefully make it for a change for the better to help us get through these global problems that we're all facing, especially in the environment. We are not through nationalism gonna fix a global problem. We need to bond together and figure out, take the best of the world and figure out local problems and solve those as well as the global problems through this collision of technology into yeah. every single industry uh, on the planet Great. to help us solve these problems. Thank you so much, Tony. Finally, after all these years and with help of some people who I'm not gonna name, you know who you are. <laughs> We finally got you here after all Thank these you. years. Thank you. It's and great to be here. Here is to. Thank you. Thank you.